On today's episode of Amazing Plastic, we do some molding and we do a whole lot of painting. Stay tuned. Promotional consideration for Amazing Plastic the Scale Model Show is brought to you by Tenet Controls, makers of scale model lighting systems. Tenet Controls brings models to life. Visit them today at tenetcontrols.com. And by Paleo Acrylic Paints, with a wide range of highly pigmented colors specially formulated for models and miniatures. Paleo Acrylic Paints sold at hobby stores worldwide. And by Model Land Limited, specializing in radio control and scale models. Our store may be small, but our inventory is huge. Visit them today at modelland.com. Welcome to Amazing Plastic the Scale Model Show. I'm your host, Richard Cleveland. We have got a full show for you today. There's so much stuff on today's show, I had a hard time fitting it all into one hour. We've got Jay Barron back from Evil Duck Creations. He's going to be pouring some material into the molds that he made last week. And I'm going to get busy on the F100 as we do some weathering effects on the frame and show you how we take it from good looking to old and dirty and dingy and, you know, just kind of, you almost want to wash the truck. We're going to be wrapping up the truck on next week's show, so you'll be able to see that and it'll be in its finished stage. We've been posting some pictures of it up on our Google Plus page over at amazing plastic on google plus make sure you go check that out if you're not a member become a member it's free there's lots of great people over there we want you to come by and and say hi and tell us what you're building and if you've got any questions we would be happy to answer them for you there's all kinds of great people over there that can act as mentors there's newbies there's veterans there's all kinds of people over there so make sure you come by amazing plastic on google plus and uh, become a member over there now uh, what else we got going on on today's show? I'm going to be talking a lot about paint today. Uh, we're going to talk about some of the paints that you can use, some of the paints that might be a little hazardous to your health, uh, some ways to keep yourself safe while painting with some of the more harsher of the paint lines that are out there. And uh, what else we got going on? Well, we got news. We've got and a whole lot more. We've also got your tip of the week, and we've got a great build from one of our community members and i'm going to keep that a surprise till we reveal a little bit later on in the show so we're going to get on to the news well in model news this week we've got a lot of releases to tell you about now there are some great stuff coming down the pipe in the sci-fi world uh and fantasy model kits we have got some great stuff figures uh real space there's all kinds of stuff coming late in 2013 which will be later this month into next month uh right in time for christmas and we're also going to tell you about some of the stuff in 2014 first of all amt is re-releasing the uss defiant from deep space nine now this kit is going to be at a 420th scale and uh, it is due to be released on february 14th so not quite in time for the holiday season but if you're a deep space nine fan this was a great little model to have now, uh, Mobius Models is going to be releasing the 1966 Batman, and this is due out in 2014. Uh, the date of that is still to be announced. We also are going to see from Mobius Models very soon, just uh, on the other side of the new year in January, we are going to see the B-9 robot from Lost in Space. Now, this is the robot that we saw in the original television series. And this will be a 1-6 scale. I think this is the largest scale of this particular model that we've ever seen. Uh, we're also going to see the Cylon Raider from the classic TV version of Battlestar Galactica. This is going to be a 132nd scale. And this is due to be released before the end of the year. Now, there's no word as to whether they're going to make the release date before Christmas or not. 
um, but we are anticipating that very soon. We all know that the Viper has come out. If you look around the net, you'll see lots of guys that are now building the Mark One Viper from Battlestar Galactica. As a matter of fact, I've got one here in the studio. And we're going to be building that pretty soon as well. Uh, also from Battlestar Galactica, which is due out in 2014. Now, there's no scale on this, but this will be the Battlestar Galactica from the classic TV version of the show. We're going to see the Man of Steel General Zod figure. This is the one eight scale figure in 2014, as well as Superman from Man of Steel in 2014. Now, Mars Attacks, uh, the Martian from Mars Attacks is due out before Christmas. I think it's already hit shelves. I'm not quite sure. Uh, check with your local hobby store on this. It's from Mobius. Uh, what else we got? Pegasus is going to be releasing the lunar spacecraft or the Luna spacecraft in 2014 as well. Uh, the T2 hover robot in 2014 from Pegasus and the T2 track robot will also be coming out in 2014. We also from Polar Lights are going to see a classic Batman and Robin figures in 2014. A 125th scale classic TV Batmobile from Polar Lights. I think that's going to be a re-release. And new will be a 1,000 scale, a 1, 1,000 scale USS Reliant from Polar Lights due in June of 2014. Um, now coming in March of 2014 from Ravel, we're going to see the Gemini Space Capsule. This is a new kit. And we are also going to see a new 130th scale X-Wing fighter from Ravel. And this is from the Star Wars line. That's due out in January of 2014. Now, we've got a few more that I want to quickly touch on. And coming from the world of autos, trucks, motorcycles, uh, this these kit releases, we're going to see from AMT a 36 Ford Coupe which will be out December 13th, a 44 Coupe, also out in December 2013, and a 44 Coupe Original Art Series, which will be out in in December as well. Uh, Aoshima's got quite a few uh, coming out as well, uh, scattered throughout January and December of this year. These are all new kits. A police motorcycle, by the way, will be coming out from them. And a mobile food truck. I'm not sure what that's all about, but uh, Hasegawa is going to be releasing the Datsun Fairlady 240Z 71 Safari Rally. Uh, this is coming out in a 124 scale, and it will be released January of 2014. Uh, MPC is going to be releasing the 71 Dodge Demon, and the one I'm really excited about is the 69 Camaro, the Foos Camaro. This is a 112 scale vehicle. So lots of vehicles coming out. Lots of models coming out. Make sure that you check that stuff out online. Go to your favorite hobby store. Find out when these things are going to drop. And if we can get more information for you, we will. I want to tell you quickly about my good friend, Jason Garris, who runs Video Workbench. If you're not familiar with Video Workbench, I encourage you to go over and check out Video Workbench. He's got a great contest going on. And that contest is... Uh, in cooperation with us over here at Amazing Plastic, the Scale Model Show. Now, this contest, uh, there will be a total of 12 instructional video prizes uh, to be given away by Video Workbench this holiday season to aid model kit builders over the long winter months to help complete their project. So if you've got some projects, you're feeling a little stuck and you need some inspiration, these might be uh, just in time for you. First prize is the grand prize worth about $90. This is the whole package deal, all seven instructional DVDs or digital downloads. The second prize is three instructional DVDs or digital downloads. Uh, third prize is two instructional DVDs or digital downloads. And there will be nine fourth place prize winners of one instructional DVD to each or a digital download of their choice. Now, the contest is open from November 9th, today's date, through to December 10th of 2013. All entries have to be in no later than December 10th, 2013, by 11.59 p.m. Central Standard Time. So make sure you know what Central Standard Time is to get your entry in on time. Winners will be announced on December 14th, 2013, right here on Amazing Plastic Scale Model Show, as well as the Video Workbench website. 
and on the Video Workbench YouTube channel. The contest is free and open worldwide, so it's not just North America. He's ready to send this to anybody, anywhere, on any part of dry land, as long as you have an internet connection. Um, now, this is, uh, you can only enter on the Video Workbench site only. Now, to enter, entrants need to go to www.videoworkbench.com slash hashtag exclamation mark contest. You must fill out the official contest entry form. No standalone emails will be accepted. So uh, the rest of the v- rules and regulations will be posted on our Amazing Plastic Google Plus community as well as over at our website. So look for those by Monday. Now, we've got a couple of other things I want to quickly tell you about. Uh, some people have been asking, where can they get this fabulous T-shirt? You see that? This is the Amazing Plastic logo right on a T-shirt. Well, we've got all kinds of great things at our Cafe Press store. It's Cafe Press slash Amazing Plastic. Just go over there. We've added a bunch of stuff for the holiday season. Uh, if you need that little bit of, warmth we've got a flask there for you we've got a clock to hang on your wall in your studio or work area we've got aprons we've got t-shirts we've got all kinds of stuff we even have pajamas so if you're really keen about amazing plastic and you want to wear it to bed well now you can because there's tops and bottoms for both men and women all kinds of other great stuff over there go check them out hoodies zip up uh hoodies as well and uh, if you want to get something, get it now. And there's all kinds of deals. We're trying to post as many deals as we can right up until we take our Christmas break. So make sure you keep checking our community page, which is Amazing Plastic over on Google+. Plus. That's it for the news. We're going to get into our next big feature, which is our G+, Plus Community Spotlight Builder. <laughs> On this week's Community Spotlight member, we celebrate the work of Nick Vildas. In this particular build, it was Snoopy versus the Red Baron from scratch. He didn't use any traditional plastic model kits to build this. He chose to build Snoopy versus the Red Baron as a subject matter after watching It's a Great Pumpkin Charlie Brown repeatedly over the months of September and October with his wife and his three-year-old daughter. Now, the first thing he did was Photoshop some screen grabs together in the exact size that he wanted for the final figure. He then uh, mocked it all up in cardboard and stuck Darth Vader action figure on it uh, just for fun, and you can check that out in some of the pictures. Uh, He also used some scrap pieces of quarter-inch poplar that he had kicking around his garage to put together the doghouse. He used uh, some wire that he had uh, 20 gauge steel wire that he had uh, around the house to make his armature for Snoopy as he sits on top of the doghouse and to wire him into the doghouse. Then he used Super Sculpty to put it all together and uh, get the final look of what Snoopy was or is. Now he picked up a wooden plaque from Michael's and he pre-stained the entire with a water-based wood conditioner and he paid special attention to the edge and soak up the stain, uh, and uh, it looked like it was a great build from there. Now, after he baked the sculpty sculpture of Snoopy, he finally did some painting work on it with uh, paints from his local dollar store, so he saved some money there as well. And uh, he put it all together, put in a detachable smoke trail, and uh, finally rendered himself a nice little display of Snoopy versing the Red Baron uh, without the Red Baron, mind you. But uh, we want to celebrate Nick Vildas and the work that he does, not only on plastic model kits, but also scratch building right here on Amazing Plastic. Now, if you caught last week's show, you'll know that my good friend Alex Johnson dropped by and was asking a bunch of questions about how to get started in building his first scale model. Well, we showed him some stuff on the F100 build that we've been working on. And we've gotten actually quite far. The chassis is all put together. Uh, We just have to put on the wheels. But this week, what I wanted to show you was some paint techniques. I've been posting some photos over at our G Plus community uh, for Amazing Plastic. And people have been asking me how I got the detail 
uh, that we got on the engine, the weathering detail, we made it look really old and kind of grungy and really used. So we've carried that through onto the chassis. Uh, this vehicle that we're building, the F100, is not a curbside vehicle. This is a vehicle that has been used. It's old. It's rusting out. And I'm going to be showing you some of that technique right away. All right. So we've got our uh, chassis all done up here. And a lot of people have been asking me, well, geez, you know, how did you get that wonderful weathering effect? And are you going to carry that through on the rest of the model? Well, it wouldn't make any sense not to carry this uh, weathering effect through. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to take this and we are going to uh, weather the chassis so that it looks a lot more like the engine and it looks like an old vehicle. All right. So what we're going to do first is we are going to take our pallet. And we have our sheet of glass here. You don't necessarily need a sheet of glass, but it's always good to have. And we're going to pick some colors. We're also going to pick some pigments. We're going to use pigments today. Uh, and the paints that we're using are from Vallejo. Vallejo, we want to thank them for their sponsorship of Amazing Plastic. And we are going to use, uh, this is Sepia Shade, which is number 73200. This is a wash, uh, one of the washes from Vallejo. And we are going to also use some of the lighter wash, which is this, this is the umber shade. So almost like a burnt umber. We're going to use that one as well. Uh, we're going to use a rust pigment. And the pigment we're going to use today is okra. And this is their rouge foundation or dark red okra. Uh, pigment. We're going to use that today and we're just going to use some straight paint and a little bit of alcohol to help us uh, get the weathered effect that we are looking for. So first and foremost, we want to get that dirty look. So, well, how do we go about starting that? Well, first and foremost, you want to start laying down washes and we're going to do a little dry brushing as well because we want to get some of the grays in there that uh, we don't normally have. But we're going to use metalizer or a metal paint and in order to do that, I want to use a darker metal paint today. I don't want to use uh, the lighter shade, so I'm going to use a gun gray. And this is a darker shade of gray. Again, this is a Vallejo Air, but you can also brush this paint on. So we'll give it a little shake, and then we'll get started by laying down some dry brushing, and we'll start laying down our color. Now, you'll notice, you know, some of the areas on this already are done um, in a way that we just put a little paint there uh, that look like they're brand new. Well, we're going to age those and it's not going to look so new anymore. So we need a little paper towel because uh, we are going to be dry brushing. And like I explained before, with dry brushing, you want to take your paint and I'm just going to move this out of the way real quick. And you want to take your paint and you want to, although you're not loading up your brush completely, you are going to load up your brush a little bit. We're going to get our dry brush out here. Now we're using a good stiff bristle brush. This uh, is a large brush that I've just kind of cut the end off and it's nice and stiff. And I can use it for dry brushing. Now, normally, I wet my brushes before I start uh, using paint. This time, I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to dab it into the paint. And then I'm going to get most of it off. Okay. And then I'm just going to start with some of the highlights here. We're going to come down. We're just going to start just getting the highlights. Some of this just to show off some of the metal. Now, in an old vehicle like this, we didn't uh, we didn't see a lot of of uh, the metal, so um, a lot of in this case it would have been, you know, uh, covered up by crud, and that's exactly what we're going to do with this as well. We're going to we're going to be crudding this up quite a bit, and we're just keep dry brushing here. And you can see, I'm not really laying down the paint hard. Uh, some areas, if you get it, if you get the paint in some areas a little too, too brightly, 
and you're not uh, not a big fan of that, well, we're going to cover a lot of that up anyway. So we're not going to see a lot of that. All we're trying to do is just bring out some of the highlights here on the uh, the drive shaft. We'll just give that a little bit of a little bit more. Now remember, a lot of this is going to be covered up from this side. We're not even going to see it, so we're not even going to worry about that too much. We're going to get the sides here. Um, make sure that we're in camera. We're going to get some of the sides and some of these areas that we might see underneath the wheel well. We'll just kind of touch those up a little bit. All right. So you might be saying to yourself, wow, that's a pretty crappy paint job. Well, at this stage, it kind of is a crappy paint job. Because we're not going for uh, accuracy here. We're just going for a little bit of a look. Just to bring out some of the highlights. We're not, uh, we're not trying to hit everything. We're just trying to bring out some of the highlights. And uh, Now these leaf springs, they're normally done in a black. Uh, they're usually anodized black. So, you know, on a normal vehicle, you wouldn't see that anyway. Uh, let's see if we can keep that in frame. All right. So we're pretty much done now with laying down the, laying down the, uh, the silver color. So um, we're going to take the gun gray and we're going to put that away. All right. So we don't need that anymore. Now we're going to start working with some of the pigments and some of the washes because we want to get this thing dirty. And that part of what this is all about is making this thing dirty. Now, because it's black, dirt is going to be hard to see on here. So what we're going to do is we're going to take a little bit of the Vallejo pigment. You can see there's a little bit right there. We're just going to dump it on our glass because we're going to keep using glass and we're going to keep dry brushing this. So we're going to try and get the effect that we really want and we're going to get these tires and, and or all these these uh, these areas underneath the the chassis, the uh, the exhaust. We want to get all that grimied up and and that kind of stuff. Now, normally, you could add any kind of medium to this, rubbing alcohol, or um, I like to add the washes to this because it darkens it up a little bit. It gives it a little bit more of a mud look. So I'm going to actually be using, on this one, the sepia shade, which is a little, uh, let's just uh, shake that up a little bit. Always shake up your paints uh, because paints, when they sit for a while, they settle, and you don't want them to settle. So we're just going to keep doing this. We're going to add a few drops. You see that it rolls right off of that. Okay. Now you might be thinking, wow, that's a that's an awful lot. Well, it really isn't. So we're gonna grab ourselves a toothpick. We're just gonna mix that up a little bit. You can see already we're getting a really nice sort of rusty color into that right there. There we go. And we're dissolving all of that powder inside of our watch. And you can see it's nice and, and rusty looking. So now what we're going to do with this is we're going to dry brush this again. And the reason I used the wash was because I didn't want it to dry up too fast on me. So again, we're just going to go over this with the dry brush. And we're just going to hit all those areas that we already hit with the rust. Again, we're just we're dry brushing, so we're trying to keep all of that silver now. You can see the silver starting to go away because we're now adding a rusting effect, and you can already see it starting to take shape. Let's see, there we go. We're really starting to get the look that we're after. We're going to keep going on this, and we'll come back in just a few seconds. So our rust effect is dried up pretty much. We're just going to clean our brush here. Now what we're going to do is we're going to start going over this with some washes. And uh, we would add some, we're going to add some more dirt. We're going to get things a little darker as well. We've got a darker pigment here that we're going to use a little bit later on. And uh, you can see that. Right now, we've got the chassis, and it's starting to look, you know, 
dirty. And that's exactly what we're trying to achieve with this because it is an old, dirty truck that we're building. We're not building something that's curbside. We're building an old, dirty truck. Once you've got your color laid down, it's pretty easy now to start using the washes. And that's what we're going to do right now is I'm going to take some of the sepia shade and being that I've already, and you don't need very much, a couple of drops or a few drops there. And I've got a brush I like to use when I'm doing washes, and that is a standard brush, and I'm using a Citadel brush. Now, Citadel is not a sponsor of the show, but uh, you see this is really watery. I do like to use the brushes, um, and now I'm just going to go over a lot of this rust area that I did with the darker pigments, and uh, going to get down into all the little crevices. And it's going to darken that up a little bit so it's not quite so bright. It's also going to give it that dirty look that we've been looking for. And again, you don't have to be, you know, too, uh, too concerned. Um, you, the idea here is that we are trying to make this as dirty as possible. So normally we would also come back and take off some of the, some of the dirt that we've put on we just want to make sure that we get this into all the little crevices and make sure that we get these these chrome pipes because these chrome pipes are not new they're dirty they're old we've been on this truck for a while we want to make sure that they look dirty they look a little bit rusty and because chrome doesn't doesn't stay looking brand new all the time Make sure that we get these leaf springs in the back. Maybe we need a little bit more of the wash. You can see how fast this wash goes. It, it just picks right up, and the brush picks it up really well. And uh, in this case, if we were going for curbside, we'd be doing a much uh, different detailed job on this. But we're not. We're going for an old, rusted out kind of service vehicles the kind you'd find in a junkyard um giving it uh you know a lot of grime and, and that's really what we're doing here is we're just griming things up and a few people have been asking me um well how did you do that on the engine so this is exactly how i made it all grimy on the engine now i'm going to wash my brush here a little bit i'm just going to rinse it out and i'm just going to roll it I, I like to keep a point on my brushes um, I'm going to grab some black now, and uh, we're going to use some black on this. We're just going to shake it up. And I don't mind mixing my my shades. I really don't. I mean, it, it really helps, and I don't normally always wait till things are totally dry either. So you can see here we're just putting in some more black, and we're just going to hit certain areas now. We want to make sure that we get those leaf springs especially these pipes. And people will tell you, you know, use this stuff sparingly. And I would say the same thing to you if I were doing something that I didn't want to look like it had oil and, and grime and grease and all kinds of, you know, all kinds of the stuff that we see on the bottom of cars. And this, this truck may have some leaks somewhere, you know. Um, always want to make sure that you highlight that kind of stuff. Now, the other thing is not a lot of people are going to see this from the bottom. And like a, very few people are going to pick this up and go, oh, wow. Wow, that's a lot of detail you put into the bottom. You know what? A lot of times this doesn't get seen. And a lot of times modelers will miss this just because it doesn't get seen. And just so that, you know, we get a little bit of that top action, we're just going to cover up some of this as well. A little bit of washing. There we go. Get that pipe too. And again, I'm not being super careful. I'm just kind of getting the pipes. And All right. I kind of think we're, we're pretty much there. I may... uh. 
I may use some of the darker grime. And uh, again, I'm probably just going to highlight. And you're probably wondering, well, why are you why are you always painting this while it's still wet? Well, part of the reason I'm painting is because I'm layering the paint as as I'm going along here, and I want to make sure that a lot of this is done um, so that it does stay that kind of wet color and looks like oil and grime and junk has been leaking off this thing for years. So I'm going to take the dark pigment. I'm just going to take a little bit of that dark pigment and I can throw it into where I had it before. And most modelers will tell you, oh, don't do it like that because, you know, you're you're mixing your colors. Well, yeah, I am mixing my colors, but I'm doing it for a reason. And again, we're going to use some of that uh, sepia shade, the darker color. All right. We're just going to mix that up a little bit. And you see already, look at that. Look at that mud. And because we're using some of that color from underneath it, we've got wet again. So it's kind of reactivated it. We're just making that mud now. Now, if we wanted to make this look like real mud, we could add a little bit of gray to it so that when it dried, it would be a little bit lighter shade of brown. But again, I like to layer my color, and I'm just trying to get this mixed in fairly well. And again, I'm just going to hit this in certain areas. I'm not going to get overly crazy with it, but I am going to use my dry brush again. And I'm going to load it up, and I'm just going to dab off some of the excess. And where would I find most of that dirt? You know, probably in some of these areas here, right around. That's drive housing, you know, probably around in there. Okay. Probably going to get a little dirt up in the front end here on these leaf springs. Maybe on this crossbar. And uh, there we go. All right, so that's how. You get the dirt effect and that old dirty look. And we're just going to get those pipes in there. There we go. And we're going to clean our brush again. So that's how you get the dirt look. It's all a matter of layering your paint, using the right paint, using washes. I like to use the washes. Not everybody does. Uh, but you can see I've gotten a perfectly good effect with what I was going for and everything looks nice and dirty and rusty and it's all set to go. And, uh, now if I added a little dirt under there, you know, with some grays, uh, take a little bit of a gray wash. Just, uh, we'll just tidy that up real quick. We'll put one, two drops of gray in with that Brown. We'll mix it up. Get a little toothpick here and we'll mix it up. And uh, you see, now we got some of that gray mud. There we go. Look, it's a little bit of lighter brown now. And because we had that, that rust color in that ochre color from before, look at that. Look at that nice muddy color. And now we'll just stipple this in spots. We're not going to get it in everywhere, but we are going to stipple it in spots. All right. And there we go. And that's all there is to it, making things look old and dirty. You know, there's no better place to go than Trek Modeler. If you want to paint the most accurate version of the 1350 scale Polar Lights refit enterprise, Trek Modeler has a comprehensive guide that takes you through all the iridescence, the different types of aztec and the differences between the refit and the A. Go check out Trek Modeler today and get your copy of this fantastic guide. You won't be disappointed. Let's check in with Jay Barron from Evil Duck Creations as he takes us through the molding process today. Oh, 
again, I am Jay Barron from Evil Duck Creations, and today we're going to continue our introduction to mold making with casting. The first kind of casting that we're going to talk about is plaster casting, and uh, just because it's called plaster casting doesn't mean you have to use plaster. Uh, this right here is a pre-made mold. You can buy these in various stores, things like that. This one is intended for making rock formations, for example, for a diorama. Now, you can use plaster or you can use ultracal, various things like that, which is a, a form of plaster, but it's uh, sturdier. I like using what's called uh, Durham's water putty. It is kind of a tan powder that you mix just like plaster, and it is significantly stronger once it hardens up. It can harden, you can you can sand it to a gloss finish if you want to. You don't just have to use this for making things like rocks or whatever. I have cast parts that have ended up on a final model out of this stuff. It works great. First thing you want to do though is grease up mold a little bit. I'm just using a little bit of petroleum jelly. I don't want to say Vaseline because Vaseline is a uh, is a brand name, so and just paint a little bit of it inside the mold that you want to use. Little goes a very long way. You just, just really want to kind of just give it a little bit of a coating. And you don't absolutely have to do this. I just find that it makes the mold last longer if you do. Now that that's done, we mix water with Durham's uh, water putty. How much water you use, it's just like mixing plaster. Start mixing it, see how it goes. Try not to get powder all over the place, which you will do anyway, so don't worry about it. Need a little more water in here. You want it about, oh, it's hard to say what the final consistency is going to be. A lot of people say consistency of mayonnaise or uh, cream or whatever. The nice thing about this stuff is that it tends to work at almost any consistency that you've mixed it in. And if you use warm water when you mix it, it sets much faster. See, this is actually a little thin, but it will still work. I'm just going to pour this into the mold. Set it around a little bit. Don't worry about the bubbles. They'll go away. Most of them anyway. Might want to brace this up a little bit just to help hold it flat. See, it's already starting to set up a little bit. Now I'm going to just let that sit. And I'll let you know how long it took to set up to the point where we can take it out of the mold. I've put the Durham's water putty mold off to the side to let that cure for a while. Now I want to talk about some of the things that we talked about last time. Uh, I've mentioned that you could use epoxy for casting, and we're going to try that right now. This is just five-minute epoxy. The thing about most epoxies is that you have to mix them in a 50-50 ratio. So I'm going to put in let's fill this up to first line there, whatever that is. That's a little thing. It's gonna work fine. A little bit more. Okay. This is a two-part epoxy, obviously. This is the standard five-minute epoxy, which is not going to be five minutes. It's going to be closer to seven or eight. The more you mix, the actually, the faster it will harden. And I'm using the clay and the polymer clay Sculpey molds of the Millennium Falcon piece 
as examples. Just to show how these work, one of the nice things about using epoxy is that it dries clear or hardens. It doesn't technically dry, it cures. I want to mix it up thoroughly. One drawback to epoxy is it does make bubbles. Sometimes that's not a problem, and it also depends on how you put it into the mold. This is very thick material. But you want to mix it thoroughly. Okay. Putting it pour in. I'm going to spread that on a little bit. Put some over on the clay mold as well. Trying to just spread this out a little bit to get it to fill in any areas. Same over here. I like polymer clay better for doing molds like this. Just because it doesn't react to heat as as much. It seems to hold detail a little bit better. Alright, I'm going to let that sit. And then we will check back on that in a few minutes as well. I spoke last time about using acrylic powder, sometimes called uh, dental acrylic, to, uh, to make molds. And that works really well as well. It's a very fast mold, and it gives you a good quality one. I'm using a uh, silicone rubber mold I made of Bridge of the Enterprise B. So we'll use this as an example. Using the acrylic powder is extremely simple. First off, to keep it in a bottle with a very fine point it gives you a lot of control. Just tap the powder in to the mold. It'll flow very easily. All right. Once that's in the mold, you want to tap the mold gently to get everything leveled out. And then you take the acrylic powder activator and just very gently drip it on until all of the powder has been saturated with the liquid. You can go slowly in the later part because it does spread inside the mold. Go right up there. And now just let it sit. And as soon as uh, it has hardened up, we can remove it and take a look at it. Okay, now we're going to talk about resin casting. I'm using, again, I'm using the Alumalite resin. It's the two-part resin that I use because it's locally available and uh, it works very well for what I want. This is the mold that we made last week, the RTV silicone mold. I took the bottom off of it and as you can see it's holding the shape of the container that we used to hold it in. Just pop this out of here. You can see it popped right out and we have a perfect negative mold. So I want to find out how much of this am I going to need to make up in order to uh, actually cast a mold without having a whole bunch left over and wasting it. Stuff's a little pricey. Again, we could use salt, but when it comes to measuring inside of the mold, I prefer to use water, mainly because water is easily removable. Sometimes the salt doesn't always come out, and sometimes the salt, it just sticks well 
to the silicone. I don't quite know why. Put that in here, and it tells me that is that mark. It's about a quarter of an ounce. A quarter of an ounce of liquid. I'm going to use the ultra duster here. Just spray dust off to spray out any drips of water that might still be in. And now I'm going to mix in the aluminite itself. First thing I want to do is put in an eighth of an ounce An eighth of an ounce of clear liquid. I've got a very small hole in the tip of this. That's why it's coming out slowly. Now, the darker liquid, you may be able to see there's a separation in from the top down to here. A little lighter colored up there, a little darker down here. The darker material needs to be shaken up, and you need to shake it well. So... I'm going to do that. Don't worry, it will not transfer a bunch of bubbles in. And I moved the camera to a little higher above the shot so that you could see the mixing process and especially so that you could see the curing process. Okay, put in up to a quarter of an ounce. And then mix it. You see it is very cloudy and streaky at the moment. Stir it until it turns clear. You might even be able to feel it heat up a little bit. You want to work a little bit quickly with this stuff. I'm going to pour it into the mold. Just in case there's any bubbles down there, I wanted to tap it to get it loose. Fill it in. Now, this is going to take a few seconds, but what we're waiting for is something called flash. When resin cures, it heats up and it goes through a chemical change turns from the liquid into a solid. You'll know when that has started by it'll change completely different color. It'll go completely opaque. It's going to do what's called a flash. It can take anywhere from 30 seconds to 45 seconds in that area, but it's the perfect indicator that your material is working. And that's the flash right there. You can see it's turning white, looming. I always love that part. It's like a little miniature explosion going on inside. So I will set that aside to continue curing, and then we will unmold the different castings that we've made. Okay, let's remove some of these from their molds. This was the first one that we did, and this has not completely cured, but I might be able to get it out so you can see what it looks like. There we go. That's breaking a little bit because it is not completely cured. You really should let it sit for several hours, and it's only set for maybe about 20 minutes. But you can see this is a nice casting. We could use this, as I said before, in a diorama or some such thing. This is the water putty. Next, we have the epoxy. I'm going to warn you, when you see the epoxy, again, could still be a little soft. And when you're using regular clay, there's a lot of cleanup involved. Peel this off to the best of my ability. And again, the, the, the epoxy is still a little bit soft. Probably best to let it sit for 24 hours. And there will be cleanup involved in it, but... And little parts are starting to peek out. Once it's set completely, 
you can just run it underwater and peel away the parts. Again, this is not the best method. I don't like using regular clay. The polymer clay works a little bit better, but again, the epoxy is very sticky, so there could be a little bit of cleanup involved. But this is popping out a little bit better. Come on, you. Not the most satisfactory method of molding, but it does work. You could grease the mold with a little bit of, a, of a Vaseline or a mold release if you wanted to. There you can see this is coming out better. And again, a little bit of cleanup will be involved in the process. And you can use sculpting tools or whatever to get the rest of the putty out of there. You could also chill it in the refrigerator or something to get it to release. A little bit of alcohol will scrub away will scrub away the polymer. You can start to see some of the detail that's in there that is being pulled out. And the detail's not bad, but again, not the most satisfactory method. But it works. In a pinch. This was the acrylic powder. And this just, like I said, pops right out. We've got a nice mold. I could use this using the clear material. I could use this for, uh, I could light it. I could hit it with light from underneath and just paint the areas that I don't want lights. And that would work very well. And finally, we have the resin casting. When you have a resin casting, you want to break it loose a little bit around the edges. You see that's turned completely just a little bit off white. Break it loose from the edges. Give it a push. And it pops right out. And we've got a perfect casting that we can use. This is actually going on uh, the end of a warp nacelle. So I'm going to need to make at least one more of these, but... The resin casting is the most satisfactory for this type of thing. Some of the other casting methods, they have their drawbacks, but they do sometimes work depending on how long you let them set. The epoxy, if you let it sit overnight, really works a lot better, and you do have to scrub that clay away from it. So next time we are going to talk about doing an actual two-part mold. Let's head over to the bench now and show you this week's tip of the week. So on this week's tip, we're talking about getting rid of mold lines and a simple and easy way to do that. And you can see here on this kit, this is the bottom of a Enterprise that we just happen to have. And you can see right here that we've got a heavy mold line or flash extra flash that's on the kit and we want to we want to get rid of that without getting rid of some of the detail now what a lot of modelers will do especially if they're not familiar with the the way to do this is they will use the bladed side or the sharp side of their hobby knife what we want to do is we want to use the dull or back side of the hobby knife just to lightly scrape this area all we're going to do is just simply, by using the back side of our hobby knife, we bring that right down without destroying any of the detail. And you can see there that we've gotten rid of most of it. Now, there's a little bit left behind. And you, if you look on the back side of your hobby blade, you can see that there is residue that we scraped off from that area. So by using the back side of your hobby blade, you don't destroy what you've been working on, and if you need to clean it up a little further, just follow up with a little bit of sandpaper or a sanding stick. And there's your tip of the week. If you're interested in expanding your model building by bringing lighting 
into what you build? Well, there's no better place to go than TenantControls.com. Tenant Controls has everything that you need to light your starships right to your 125th scale cars and some train gear as well. Go check out TenantControls.com today. They're the only ones in the industry with a five-year warranty on what they produce. So check them out at TenantControls.com because Tenant Controls brings your models to life. All right, so now it's time to talk paint. We're going to head over to the bench, and I'm going to show you some of the paints that we use in the hobby of scale model building. Over here at the bench, we've got a variety of different paints that we use. Um, we mostly use Vallejo uh, Model Airline, uh, which is an acrylic-based paint. Uh, but there are times where we have to use other paints, such as enamels or lacquer-based paints. And right now, I want to start with the base of your paint. And what I mean by the base is that that foundation of color or that foundation of paint that you're going to use before you lay down that final color. So, as I said, we have a variety of different ones. Uh, we have a spray can. Um, uh, this is an enamel paint. Uh, this is a just a cheap brand of paint that you can find at any good department store, such as Walmart. Um, this is very inexpensive. I think it runs about ninety nine cents in the U.S. Uh, here in Canada, uh, it runs about uh, two dollars, maybe two fifty. I can't remember exactly. But this is an enamel-based paint. Enamel-based paints are have a high fume uh, content to them. Uh, if you're not careful and you're not using these in a well-ventilated area, they can make you dizzy and they can make you very sick. So uh, two, th two words of caution when you use this type of paint. Use a respirator uh, and also use, use this in a well-ventilated area outside if you can. Uh, in the garage uh, with the door open or using a spray booth. We're going to talk about a spray booth in an upcoming episode. Uh, but this is a, a decent paint. I've used it many times. Uh, I still continue to use it depending on the project that I'm doing. And uh, it's a good quality paint. It lays down nice and flat. But again, it's all about the base. Now, another paint I want to caution you about is enamel or lacquer-based paint. And this is a lacquer-based paint. This one comes to us from Duplicolor. Uh, this can be found in most automotive shops, good automotive places. Again, this is a great paint. This paint actually can be shot right through your airbrush, um, right onto your your uh, part or model that you're building, and it sands very well, as well as the enamel-based paint. Again, this paint can be very toxic. You must have a respirator when using this paint, and you must also have good ventilation uh, spray booth or something along that line when you're using this paint. This paint will make you very sick if you are not in a properly ventilated area. So I want to caution you on using this paint if you are not experienced with it. Most automotive guys or, or guys that are builders that uh, have worked with this kind of stuff will know the dangers of it. Uh, this is also highly flammable. Uh, so always store this paint in a area out of reach of children and uh, in a safe area where it's not going to explode. So don't put it by an open flame. Now, the paint uh, that I use most often here, and you've heard me talk about this before, is an acrylic-based paint. This one is the Vallejo brand, and uh, Vallejo is a sponsor of the show, so we have a lot of their products around here in the studio. Uh, this uh, particular paint goes on very easy. Um, again, prepping your surface is paramount as, as well as any of these other paints that we've talked about prepping your surface is the most important thing that you can do if you don't prep your surface this paint will peel right off and it won't stick to your plastic some of the things that you can do to uh, get paints to stick to your plastic is by using a adhesion promoter uh, it's fairly expensive again it uh, if not used in a well ventilated area can cause you some health issues uh, breathing that kind of stuff um, I like to use uh, the acrylic paints because you can pretty much use them anywhere without having to worry too much about um, harming you uh, health-wise. And they're either low or no order paints. So uh, I'm a big, big fan of acrylic-based primers as well as acrylic-based paints. 
So let's go on and talk about some of the paints that you might want to use uh, when painting your models. Here we have a blue uh, paint from Vallejo. This is their color line. Uh, this this line of paints has more than 256 colors, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, there's a number of colors in the range. A lot of them uh, go by the federal standard number, so you can match them up to paints maybe from another manufacturer, such as Testers, Model Master Paints, um, or somebody along that line, Tamiya as well. Uh, but this paint, again, this is an acrylic-based paint. Um, comes in these little tubes that uh, are about 17 millimeters. Um, again, just shake them up. You can brush these. You can spray these. It uh, really doesn't matter. And they flow out actually really, really nice. And just keep them... Uh, you can see how that's coming out. That's beautiful. Just keep your paints tightly sealed. Um, and you shouldn't have any problem. Now, this is a little thin. I didn't mix this up properly, obviously. Um, if I had mixed it up properly, we wouldn't have this problem. Uh, you can also use paints from your craft store, which uh, you can find at um, uh, most places around the country. Uh, craft stores, Hobby Lobby, um, Walmarts, uh, dollar stores even carry this type of paint. Uh, this is an old jar. Um, I am going to show you at some point. This stuff's pretty dried out. But uh, again, this is acrylic based paint. If you thin this properly, you can run this in an airbrush, and uh, it's really quite nice to use. Um, I don't recommend using this kind of stuff if you're doing models that you want to have a long lasting finish on. Um, but, you know, some guys use them all the time and they get great results out of them. Now, another acrylic based paint is uh, a paint by Citadel. And these are the guys who make uh, the miniatures for tabletop wargaming. Um, you can find these pots. I think the pots have changed. This is, again, this is a fairly old uh, canister of paint. Um, but you can, get, uh, you can get paints like this at any games workshop or good hobby stores that sells games workshop products. That's the only way you can get these. Um, they have a great line, uh, a lot of colors. If you're, again, they're acrylic based paint. So I have a lot of different acrylics. Um, so this is a, this is a really good uh, paint that you can use as well. Now, when we talk about enamels, Model Master makes probably some of the best enamels out there. Testers has been around for years. Model Master is a line of their products. This just happens to be gloss black. Again, you want to shake these up. Just like any paint that you're using, shake them up really well before you start painting with them um, and get yourself a good set of brushes. This stuff can also be put through an airbrush if it's thinned properly with the proper thinners. Um, but being that it's an enamel, again, you want to be in a well-ventilated area. You want to make sure that you have a proper uh, respirator on when you're spraying this. Again, because of the odor of this paint mixed with the thinners, that you may use um, this can uh, this can cause some health issues and probably not the best thing uh, for you to use. This brushes on really well as well. Um, get yourself a good set of brushes as well. Paint aren't the only things that you can you can find. I mean, there's all kinds of different types of stuff out there. Uh, earlier on in the show, we showed you how to use the powdered pigments. Uh, these can be mixed with. Uh, either water or as you saw me use earlier, I use some of the washes. Um, you can get, uh, you can use this with alcohol. A lot of people will use this with alcohol, um, thinned properly. These can, these can also be sprayed as well. So it's uh, something to keep in mind. Uh, what else have we got? Uh, well, we've got, uh, again, lacquer based all clad is again, a lacquer based paint. And again, this is a high fume. This is a clear base I'm just showing you. Uh, I purchased this because I will be mixing it with some powders later on. And not the same as these powders, which we've talked about before, but uh, I've got a big project coming up that I will be using this as a base for some iridescent paints that I will be using. And uh, I will be mixing them in with this, uh, this lacquer-based uh, product. Uh, this is 
clear base, so it doesn't have a high sheen to it. So I'm not looking for something that has a high gloss. This is going to be uh, pretty much a matte base, so I won't have any problems with that uh, either. But again, I will be using this in a spray booth. I won't just be spraying on my table like you've seen me do in the past. I will be using this with a spray booth and using this with a respirator. Now, you've asked me about respirators in the past. What is a good thing to buy? Are those little paper masks that, that we find for painting and, and dust masks, are they good? No, they're not. This is what you need. I recommend that you get yourself a good 3M dust mask or um, a respirator mask. Now, this uh, particular one that I have on here, this is for vapors. Uh, I have uh, the the uh, proper organic vapor um, filters on there, so I don't get any of the vapors from this or any of the vapors from uh, uh, the primer that you saw me uh, pull out earlier. Uh, this will help to save your life. So I. I re would recommend highly, I can't recommend highly enough, that you get yourself a good mask for, paint, for painting when you are using um, lacquer-based uh, or even some of the enamel-based paints. Enamels, think of enamels like nail polish. Nail polish has a high um, smell to it. Uh, if you've ever been around your wife, your girlfriend, your mother, while they're painting their nails, you know, it has kind of a high odor to it. This year, if you're exposed to those odors for long enough, they can cause you some problems. So uh, if you're painting a lot of models like we do here on the show, you want to make sure that you have a good, good dust mask or a good uh, a respirator with vapor, organic vapor filters on it. So it keeps out the vapors uh, and, uh, you know, helps you in the end. All right. So there's our talk about paint. Uh, we're going to quickly talk about brushes. Uh, what are the how do you apply paint? Well, you apply it using brushes, and you saw me use some of these brushes earlier on in the show today. Uh, and I use I use the Citadel brushes um, just because uh, I have a history with Games Workshop, uh, so I still have a lot of these from my days uh, working for that company, and uh, I use them all the time. If you take care of your brushes. They will last you a long, long time. I've had these brushes for more than 15 years. So that just shows you that if you invest money into brushes and you take care of them, they will last you a lifetime. Uh, some some of these are getting pretty close that uh, I may have to uh, start replacing them. But you know what? They are good for brushing on paint. Um, different size tips. Everything from a triple zero all the way up to a nice large dry brush like i have here now i didn't use this dry brush earlier i actually took a large brush that i had trimmed down uh for my dry brush and i prefer that uh, more so than this brush uh other than that uh brushes get yourself a good set of brushes um a good set that will probably run you in the neighborhood of anywhere from 12 to 25 dollars for a reasonable set of brushes that you're going to be able to use uh, while you're doing your your painting now, the other type of brush that you're going to use is an airbrush. And I use an airbrush. Right now, I use a Pash. I will, or a Pache, whichever, uh, you know, however you want to pronounce that. Uh, this is an airbrush. I use it with my acrylic paints quite often. Um, I just throw some primer in here. I don't even have to thin it, and I can start spraying right away. And uh, you can see that this, uh, this Pache is well used. It's, it's due for another cleaning here real soon. But uh, what this does is you put your, your paint in the cup or in the jar and the, press, the air pressure coming up through the hose is released by pushing the, the, the button and you can adjust your spray uh, or the amount of paint that comes out just by adjusting this needle right here. So, um, and that will adjust the, and you've seen me use this uh, in an earlier episode. Uh, I will be... Uh, uh, using an water brush here very shortly, a double action. This is what we call a single action. So when you push down, both paint and air are released um, based on how much paint you have adjusted through the nozzle uh, adjustment right here. Uh, 
Uh, but a double action airbrush, we're going to, we're going to get into that a little bit later on. And of course, rattle cans, just like we showed you earlier, these can be used to paint your models as well. Again, rattle cans can, uh, cause you, uh, health issues. This again is flammable, so store it very well. It's explosive as well, so don't get near an open flame where you could be in real trouble. Uh, and they are poisonous. So um, again, use that respirator. That's it for paint. If you've got any questions, please feel free to write me at info at amazingplastic.com, and we will see you next time here at the bench. We'll be talking about more. Hey, if you're looking to find us around the web, well, it's not that hard. You can check us out on Google Plus at our community, Amazing Plastic. You can find us on the World Wide Web at AmazingPlastic.com. Over there, you're going to find articles, tips, tricks, and this show right here, Amazing Plastic Scale Model Show. Uh, as well as you can find us on Facebook. We're also on Twitter, and we have a YouTube channel which really doesn't contain the show, but it does contain a little bit of extra stuff that you may want to check out from time to time. You can get a high-quality version of this show for download from our website at amazingplastic.com. So comment, like us, and share us around the web. Tell your friends that this is the place to be for all your modeling news and how-tos. Well, we've come to the end of another episode of Amazing Plastic Scale Model Show. And I want to thank a lot of people this week for helping to get this show to where it is already. We've had a lot of views of our previous episodes, both on Google Plus and on our website at amazingplastic.com and over at our Amazing Plastic YouTube page. Uh, you guys like the show. We've had a lot of positive comments. Keep your comments coming. Keep your questions coming because without your questions, we don't really have a show because it's a community that makes this show work. Now, Jay Barron is one of the individuals I want to thank this week for all that he does behind the scenes and the segments that he contributes to the show. I also want to thank uh, each and every one of you for tuning in and keep it up and tell your friends about it. As we progress forward, you're going to see a lot more stuff down the pipe. I want to take this opportunity also to thank some of the people behind the scenes, uh, including Christina Pritchard, who is well over in England. She is a wonderful gal. She knows a lot about this hobby and she's so young. It's amazing how much knowledge she has. I want to thank Mike Bassford for all his insights and uh, the way that he builds things. I want to thank who else do I want to thank on this list? There's so many people to thank. I want to thank Kimberly Andrews for taking care of our social media each and every week. Uh, we also want to thank Jack Holzer, who is the host of our Hangouts Across the Pond and our Sunday night Hangouts uh, over on Google+. Plus. So thank you very much for all those. Malavictus, who is Danny Monahan, and uh, he does a great job as well. You're going to see more from Danny in upcoming episodes. And I want to invite you, the viewer, to send in your tips, tricks, and anything that you may want to have featured on our show, because this show is about you, the community of model builders. So thank you to everybody. Thank you to our sponsors each and every week that uh, help us out. Tenacontrols.com. Check them out because Tenet Controls brings your stuff to life uh, through lighting and uh, a great many other things. I want to thank the guys over at the Fiber Optics Store. Uh, they did a great job in uh, helping us with some of the fiber optics that we need for upcoming projects. Uh, I want to thank the fine folks over at Vallejo Paints for the paints that we use here on the show. And I also want to thank the fine folks over at Model Land uh, for their support of the show with some tools from time to time. Now, there may be some changes coming up in the very near future. Stick stick with us because there's all kinds of great stuff i also want to point out that you can go and get yourself one of these fabulous t-shirts called amazing plastic the scale model show you can find that over at our cafe press store at cafe press slash amazing plastic there's coffee cups over there there's aprons there's t-shirts there's hoodies all kinds of great stuff so Show your pride for Amazing Plastic. Go over and get yourself a t-shirt. They're not that expensive, and they're a great quality. And I want to thank you once again for joining us here on Amazing Plastic. It's been great doing this show, and I will continue to bring this show to you each and every week. And we'll see you next week at the workbench.